Good evening and welcome to Chasing the Facts. I'm Sam Chase, your host, and with us this evening from Neshoba Valley Technical High School is Lawrence McDonald, who is on the school committee and one of Chelmsford's representatives on that school committee. And also with us is Jeremy Slotnick, uh, the school's principal. So, Lawrence, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe you can introduce Jeremy to the audience and uh, we'll take it from there. I appreciate that. Thanks for having us, Sam. Um, as you know, Chumpsford has uh, three reps and an alternate, and uh, Don Ayer, Sam Poulton, Claire Janot, and I represent Chumpsford. Uh, Jeremy is the principal of uh, Neshoba Tech and uh, runs the whole day-to-day -day operation. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy, you've had a background at the school for how many years? <clears throat> I have. I've been there 15 years now. And you started as? I started as, as a classroom teacher in English. Um, I moved up to a position of cluster chair, uh, which is similar to a department head at most schools. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I was um, in charge of, of testing um, and data uh, for several years. And then I moved into the assistant principal role. And now this is my third year as principal. Now, as uh, performing all of these functions in a regional vocational school, you have to meet all of the same uh, certifications and obtain the same credentials as somebody who is in a traditional district school. So to be a principal, you mm -hmm. have to meet all of those state requirements and, and so forth and that's, certifications. Okay. That's correct. And, and in, in <laughs> fact, in a vocational school, so I actually have two principal certifications, one for a vocational high school and one for an academic high school. And, and the benefit of that is it allows me to supervise both academic and technical teachers. Oh, okay. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that there was that distinction within the, within the school itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Well, that's one of the reasons I have you both on here, because I don't think uh, there is a... Um, a really good understanding that people have uh, concerning the differences between a vocational high school and the educational mm -hmm. offerings and what you find in a, and I'm going to use this term, and you, if you can come up with a better term, please use it, a more traditional school setting. And uh, I hate to use the word academic because you have a very strong academic program at Neshoba Valley. I mean, you're an English teacher. Right. So there you are. <laughs> But, uh, you know, there is that distinction in people's minds. So, and if I may, Sam, when, right we, ahead. when we were looking at the school for um, some of our children, I went on the day where they are open to the public and you get to meet the mm -hmm. teachers, and I really drilled down on questioning the academic teachers. I wanted to know what books were taught. I wanted to know what scores were. And I walked away really impressed, and I've always been very impressed since about the academics at Neshoba Tech and the number of students that uh, achieved the Adams Scholarship because of their uh, MCAS scores, the number that uh, go to colleges, the number that do really well. Even some of them get scholarships from pretty impressive institutions mm -hmm. like Tufts. Mm -hmm. and WPI. I remember, I forget how many years ago it was uh, now, it was a few, but I remember the first person that you had that went on to MIT. And that was a very impressive uh, achievement, I think, and an awful lot of people were kind of surprised when they saw that. And, well, you know, you think, well, they have to, they have to meet the same standards and criteria, and especially now that we have the MCAS, I mm -hmm. don't imagine that there's really much of a difference in the academics that are taught in your school versus uh, a more traditional uh, high school. So. It's funny you should mention MIT because a couple of years ago we almost um, did a joint venture with MIT and we went to visit them, they came to visit us, mm. and they said, you know, they're really just a vocational technical school too. The MIT folks said that. They said they are, yes, and they were actually quite impressed with mm. the uh, way Neshoba Tech is laid out and equipped and uh, run. But yeah, so MIT has a lot in common, at least they say they have a lot in common with what we do over there. That's very interesting, and, and you bring up an interesting point. Old perceptions die hard. But technology, the, the definition of what is technical has changed. Of course. In, over the last, 
I'm going to go with 40 years. Mm -hmm. And even uh, in the last 15 years, you know, those of us that have to buy a new computer every five years because <laughs> because the technology becomes obsolete, I guess I understand that. But but go ahead. I didn't mean to well, no, cut you off. But I mean, uh, we're always looking for opportunities to evaluate what's going on over mm -hmm. there at Neshoba Tech and whether we can do better or more, but you know, it's a pretty good school on an academic level too, and of course, mm -hmm. you would have much more insight than I would on mm -hmm. this. Right, I mean, we really, you know, run the gamut of, of what we offer. We have AP classes, we have a program called Early College Education where students receive college credit for classes they're taking right at Neshoba Tech. Some of our instructors are, are certified uh, through the community college system in Massachusetts and accredited, and, and therefore our students who take their classes then earn that credit. Um, in addition, uh, Mr. McDonald mentioned uh, how we're always trying to improve and, and be better. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, that each of our technical programs is required to have an advisory board that they meet with at least two times a year, and that's a board of industry professionals, people in higher education, mm -hmm. parents and students, and, and they receive insight into what is gonna make our students successful. They evaluate what's in the program as far as technology and equipment. They look at the curriculum. They have in-depth conversations with our teachers about ways to make the program the best it can be in order to make our kids successful in higher ed, further training, or going right into the workforce. And, and that's a real advantage that, that we have with our students that, that you don't see many places. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I want to uh, just pivot a little bit and ask a question that uh, I've been asked many, many times by people about the differences between uh, a regular um, town school district and, and uh, a technical high school district. Now, you are, you are called the Neshoba Valley Technical High School, but you're considered a school district. Is that, that, is that a That's correct That's 100% statement? correct. So uh, I've had, oh, probably over the last 15 years, probably 30 or 40 times, people have said, why do you need a principal and a superintendent for one building? Mm -hmm. So I'd like you to kind of sure. explain that so it's, the folks can understand. It's, <laughs> a, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. and, and my purview is mainly day-to-day um, -day operations and serving as, as the educational leader in the school. So I, I am responsible for security, for assigning teachers, for making sure that equipment and facilities run well, all those things that, that happen in the building. And in addition, I am setting the, the educational goals and expectations for staff and students within the building. And, and basically everything else would be the responsibility of the superintendent. So that's you know dealing with anything having to do with our, our eight sending towns, that's uh, setting policy along with the school committee, and that's being highly responsible for what occurs in the budget, which in a lot of ways is the driving force for, for most of mm -hmm. what we're able to do within the school. And I think that's a very good answer. And if, uh, if I could add something just from my perspective, mm -hmm. and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, um, the way I've always looked at it is, you, and, you, and you said it yourself in your answer, eight member towns, okay? That says district to me. Mm -hmm. And if, if uh, anybody who's ever been involved in any kind of an administrative activity, I don't care whether it's public sector, private sector, education, we all understand that uh, there's a lot of politics involved. So I'm, I'm just trying to imagine uh, Denise Pigeon having to deal with eight different towns uh, from an academic perspective. It's not the same as just being in one town and having to deal with one school committee. You've got a school committee. We have three members from Chelmsford mm -hmm. because we are the largest sending district. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, our and, district agreement, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Go ahead. But our district agreement is unique in some ways. The membership is based on the population of the school mm -hmm. over a 10, well, actually, I think they take the population every 10 years. And Chelmsford is at the moment, 30% or a little bit above 30% right. of the school uh, population. And I think um, Littleton is the town with the fewest. But I think that the school committee works in a very blended way. I think that when we are doing the work, when we are sitting at the table, we don't think of 
I'm here for Chelmsford students. We're here for students. Understand, right. Right. No, because you wouldn't make that distinction when you're trying to deliver the educational product. Right. They're all students, right. you know. But to follow up on that point, so uh, would it be fair to say we have, we have three, uh, three members uh, of the committee are from Chelmsford, and then we have one alternate. Correct. So that's four people. So you said Littleton is probably the smallest. So how many reps would they have on, this, on the committee? They have one, one and an alternate. And an alternate, okay. Everybody's got an alternate and... Um, That's a large committee. It is. It's, it's 13 sitting members plus eight alternates. Wow. So potentially you have 21 people sitting in the room plus people from the administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a large... That's a large meeting. <laughs> yes, I actually. It's amazing you can get out of your own way. <laughs> I've, I've actually joked. It's pretty efficient, really. Yeah, I, I've, I, I would, uh, yeah. I would say so. Yes. I've actually joked that our committee is bigger than some schools. Yes. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize the scale. I never, I guess, I never thought about it. The only time I ever look at it is once a year when it comes time for the budget, mm -hmm. and we, then we look at the numbers. And we just had a, uh, uh, we just had our. Uh, annual town meeting, as you know, and uh, we did pass the uh, suggested budget. But prior to that, we had a meeting with the uh, representatives from the uh, school committee and Dr. Pigeon, and uh, I'm on the finance committee in Chelmsford, and we had a very good session, and I was just very impressed with the degree of thoroughness and preparation <coughs> mm -hmm. and the presentation itself, and of course it was very informative. Uh, you learn uh, an awful lot of things. As, as Lawrence said, we're, we're the largest um, town in terms of student uh, representation in the school. One thing that interested me was the per pupil cost. And if I remember correctly, I think you're the lowest in the region. Um. Well, in, in terms of technical high schools, we're we're in the lower mid of technical high schools. Lower mid, okay. very similar to Assabet Valley and some of our other sister schools. Very similar to what Greater Lowell. Mm -hmm. The numbers are very close, um, but you know the budget process is an ongoing process, and it starts. It's a zero-based budget. Okay, explain that to the So audience. it's a zero-based budget, mm -hmm. and you can help me on how this works in sure. the day-to-day. -day. From the school committee, what we understand is it's a zero-based budget. Everybody in the school starts from a blank piece of paper. Mm -hmm. You had pencils last year. That doesn't mean you're getting pencils right, this so year. So that's a real zero-based. Uh, assume you, you start from nothing, and you have to build a budget every year. You don't simply tack on a percentage from the prior year. Mm -hmm. And so... Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work within this? Yep. This so, staff? so every October, um, the superintendent goes out with a with a, a basically a staff wide budget mm -hmm. message, where she explains that we are in the budget planning stage, and um, she explains the zero based budget um, idea every year, basically, uh, to remind people, and and then it goes out to our our department heads, and it starts there, um, and they build their budget, and then they each have supervisors. I mentioned that I supervise academic teachers and also technical teachers, mm -hmm. so I supervise our culinary arts and our automotive departments. So once they've built their budget, those come to me, and then I look at those, and I usually um, compare them to the last year, and if they have any new expenses, I'll go back and say, can you explain why you have this this expense here, and you know why is this different than it, than it might have been last year, and, and we take a look at what really is necessary and have a little bit of a back and forth mm -hmm. to see what really is necessary for the program to grow and be its best. Um, and that also happens with the academic departments. I oversee social studies and English, so I do the same thing with those department heads. Um, and then once I think it looks good, I pass it on to Denise and our business manager, and they might have additional questions or concerns. Mm -hmm. And again, we would go through that process together and eventually arrive at the budget where it is. Then it has to be sold to eight Member Correct. Towns. But there are interim steps. Hmm. At that point, it goes to the um, budget subcommittee of the uh, district school committee where we go over it all again. And then it's reviewed, if it's recommended, it's reviewed to go to the full committee and then we have a budget workshop with the entire committee and, and with the 
administration and we go over it all again. And by the time that you even see it uh, when you come over for breakfast, uh, that budget has been gone over so many times that I don't think there's a line that hasn't been scrutinized. There are, there are many, many iterations. And something Dr. Pigeon instituted, which is a little different, is any time an item is removed or changed, it doesn't just, you know, everything's electronic now, obviously, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't just come out and disappear. It's, it's left in with the change, so almost like a track changes. So we really have a sense of you know, where the changes occurred, and then sometimes you know, there's an item that, all right, it doesn't fit in the budget this year, but down the road it might be something that, if we think it's important, we'll take a look at that again next year or two years down the road, and, and she really emphasizes being fiscally responsible, but also making sure that everyone has what they need to really mm -hmm. give our students the best education they can have. And it is a 50-something-year-old building that doesn't look like it, by the way. Well, that's the, that's the thing. I mean, you drive by that building, and you're, you're absolutely right. It does not look like a 50-year-old building. But you've got to put the maintenance in. And a so, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. s not to digress too much, but several years ago, we were not sure what the risks were, what were the, the unknown unknowns. And so we either were faced with having to put to put aside a lot of money for the unknown unknowns or trying to figure out what those were. And so uh, we engaged uh, an architectural engineering firm to work with our equipment and facilities subcommittee, which is very talented. And there's been a, a capital plan uh, put in place so we know what we're going to need to tackle in what time frames and what our risks are and so we work the capital into the budget, the capital needs into the budget each year, mm -hmm. which is much easier than coming back and asking for a new building. And it's the right way to do it. Right. Obviously. So <clears throat> we've had visitors who are astounded, astonished really that it's a 50 something year old building, but there is a facilities manager who works tirelessly and, and and it's clean it's as clean as a whistle if you go in there I mean I, I hadn't I as I said I went in there this uh, a few weeks ago before our town meeting for for our budget meeting and I hadn't I don't think I had been in the building for oh probably 15 years and I was just astounded because I know how old the mm -hmm. building is and I thought wow and I remember saying to um, um, I think it was Dave Goslin, who's one of our other FinCon members, I said, boy, I said, they really take care of this building. And it, it shows. And, you know, I think that, uh, I say it because I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important for people to know that uh, that's high on the priority list is, 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 uh, is the building maintenance and making sure that your capital investment, the investment that the taxpayers may, uh, make is... Uh, well looked after, so I think we, we we can feel confident in that. And this is a this is a an advantage I think of having such a large committee. One of our members is um, a safety engineer who used to work in the roofing business. Mm. So when we have projects like that, one of our members works in the HVAC business. You know we have perfect people on those committees mm -hmm. who have that real-world experience that we can draw upon, mm -hmm. and we do. It's perfect. So now I've got, uh, this is hypothetical obviously, but I've got a daughter and she's in the, about to go into the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And she shows uh, some inclination towards uh, maybe a little bit more technical, uh, vocational. Um, how do we go about finding out getting the information and if we are interested maybe you can describe uh, the application process is there any kind of a meet and greet type situation mm -hmm. just uh, if we can go into so, that a little bit. Yeah so we try to advertise the school a couple different ways mm -hmm. we have a, a traveling road show that goes to every single uh, middle school in our district and does a presentation about Neshoba Tech. So, and when would this typically occur? It uh, typically the, happens in the fall. In the fall, yes. okay. So we have, our, we have a large event called, which we call Open House, the first Sunday in November mm -hmm. every year from 12 to 3. Feel free to mark your calendars. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and before that occurs, we like to get to every middle school just to make sure kids have a, a little bit of a sense of what we're about and whether or not we might be a good fit for them and, and what their uh, dreams and, and 
uh, desires for their future are, and then they can come visit us with their family at the open house event, and that's basically three hours of us giving tours and, and showing off the building and telling them a little about what all of our tech programs offer, um, how great our academics are, mm -hmm. the fact that we have, you know, a lot of the same clubs and, and athletic activities that they would have at their traditional high school, um, the fact that we offer transportation, no cost to every student in the district, the fact that we have no fees for clubs or sports, which is often a selling point, and the fact that students really are expanding their opportunities by coming to our school because 60% of our school, our students go on to some form of higher ed and the other 40% go into work or the military and, and <coughs> on both sides, they're really quite successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you have obviously formulated a plan, a, a sales plan or a marketing plan, mm -hmm. if you will, which is, which is, I'm just thinking the whole time you're talking, I'm thinking of how difficult that has to be. You've got eight towns and I know we have two middle schools in Chelmsford, so mm -hmm. that's at least nine middle schools right. that you have to go to. And uh, who, now who typically would, would do the road show? So we have a, a head of guidance and admissions and, and our guidance counselors who would typically be doing that. Okay. And you asked also about the application process. Correct. So it's, it's fully online at this point. So oh, good. if somebody goes to our website, they just click a button and it takes us to the, to the online admission portal. Um, they fill out their application and that gets the process started. And then we reach out to their middle school for the records we would need to, mm -hmm. to determine if they're a good fit for Neshoba Tech. But they don't have to come on the first Saturday in November to apply, do they? They can they apply do not. at any they time. Can, they can apply at any time, yeah. Uh, February 1st is our priority deadline for application. Mm -hmm. Now, are there certain criteria that the students have to meet in order to be accepted? So, so there are what's known as a, a selective mm -hmm. public secondary school, um, which means that we have an application process and, and students do need to meet a certain mm -hmm. standard. Um, we have tried to make sure that, that our expectation is an expectation that reflects a student who would really be successful at a technical school. Um, you know, we do have some expectations for attendance um, because if, to be honest, if you're going out into the world of work and you're not attending your job <laughs> regularly, you're not gonna be yes. successful. Um, we do have some expectations for, for grades, um, that just to show that you're putting the effort in really. I mean, we're not looking for kids who are necessarily straight A students or even AB students, but um, students who are doing well enough to, to show that they're putting in an effort and, and learning the material. Mm -hmm. um, we look at, at discipline a little bit, um, just because, you know, if you think of a carpentry shop, um, you know, you have, you have large saws. If you think of students who are working on someone's car that they're gonna then, mm -hmm. you know, drive out on 495, you wanna make sure that, that there's less fooling around and more paying attention to what they're doing. Um, in addition, there's an, an interview um, that's done either, well, lately it's done uh, virtually, but previously it was always mm -hmm. done face-to-face, -face right. and sometimes still is, and that's actually the, the largest portion of um, determining if students get in that interview, um, because that, that's how you get a sense of how passionate the student is about getting a technical education. And then there's also a recommendation from the sending school. Mm -hmm. It's a small part of that application as well. Now, uh, if a student is in a uh, regular district uh, school, let's say students in Chelmsford mm -hmm. High, and he's gone, uh, he's done his freshman year, and he decides, you know what, um, I really would like to make a switch over and show, is that possible? Can they can they get in? They, they don't have to be there the whole They do years. not have to be there okay. immediately. Um, they do have to be there for two years. All right, so that's the two years minimum. Correct. So, so once you get into your junior year, you would no longer be able to transfer, right. and that's because... Um, the students receive a Chapter 74 certificate from the state of Massachusetts, which indicates that they have learned, uh, uh, achieved a certain level of proficiency mm -hmm. in their trade, and it's been determined that it takes two years minimally mm -hmm. to earn that level of proficiency. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, each one of these uh, follows uh, a very strict uh, framework, which mm -hmm. is given to us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Correct. So, correct. So for each of our 20 programs, there's a, a set framework, um, just like Lawrence said, and there's also a program called Skills Plus, uh, which the state provides, where each of the competencies the students are supposed to have in their trade, the teacher then indicates on that whether or not they have achieved proficiency or whether they're approaching proficiency, or where they are along the spectrum of being skilled in that particular area of the trade, um, and students do need to, to achieve a certain level in each of those skills in order to achieve that Chapter 74 certificate as well. Mm -hmm. So before the show, we were talking a little bit, and Lawrence was talking about uh, how technology evolves. 
So uh, I'm an older guy, so when, uh, when I tended to think of a technical uh, high school education, I'm mm -hmm. thinking uh, carpentry, I'm thinking electrician, I'm thinking auto mechanics, uh, HVAC, that kind of thing. So maybe you can expand on that and take that as a starting point and maybe take us through the progression and addition of more so-called technical skills and maybe identify that for the audience. Sure. <laughs> so uh, we have a biotechnology program now, for example. Hmm. We have Amazing. <laughs> yeah. We have engineering technology. We mm -hmm. have uh, computer programming and website design. We have all those things that I mentioned. Right? Yes, and now, all those and things. This, and this, these, are, these are things that have evolved over the last 25 or 30 years. Correct, okay. correct. I mean, you, still want, you still want an excellent plumber, an electrician, or a carpenter who you know, are well-trained and disciplined. But as we said, technology has changed. I've right. said it before, and I'll say it again. Society can do with a few less lawyers and sociologists, hmm. but we can't do without plumbers, electricians, right. carpenters, auto mechanics, and HVAC people. We, the, have, to, we the, have to have those people. The programs are based on mm. uh, research that comes from the Department of Labor and the State Department of Labor about mm -hmm. what future labor needs are going to be. These are not whimsical decisions. Right. Now that's an interesting point because I'm going to assume probably that wasn't the case 35 or 40 years ago. I mean to the degree that it is today, that right. kind of integration and coordination. Right, but uh, Jeremy mentioned biotech. Yep. Well. I think if we haven't learned anything in the last three years, <laughs> that is a business that won't go away and that will need competent people right. on all levels. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really massive, especially here in Massachusetts. I mean, you know, Pfizer has a large presence, Moderna. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a, that is an industry that is, is looking for employees, so it just made sense. And, you know, as, as Lawrence mentioned, um, there are the, the state has a pretty significant process for opening a new Chapter 74 program. It usually takes you know multiple years mm -hmm. to do that. You have to do the the labor study that was mentioned, and then you also have to explain. You know, they have requirements for the the size of each program, uh, for the the number of instructors, for the equipment you're going to have, and they come through and they visit, and and there's a pretty stringent approval process before you can actually open a new program. Well, so. Folks, it's not your father's Neshoba Valley Technical High School anymore. And even within the traditional uh, disciplines, um, anybody who has taken their car to the mechanic understands mm -hmm. that most mechanics today are highly computer literate because you have to be. Uh, diagnostics and so forth, uh, it's all electronics. You have to understand that aspect of it. So even the traditional um, types of, of, uh, tech, uh, of uh, vocational stuff have been greatly expanded and much more is required of the student than, say, would have been required 35 or 40 years ago. Is that a fair statement? That's a, a very fair statement. Okay. And, and as I mentioned, we have those advisory boards and they mm -hmm. try to keep us on the cutting edge as well, which means increasing technology and technical know-how. Right. I mean, you know, thinking of um, environmentally friendly um, services, you know, solar power, wind power in, in electrical, mm -hmm. um, thinking about even the, the types of paint that are being used in auto collision repair so that they're more environmentally friendly. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of factors in, in every field that are constantly changing, modernizing, and we try to stay on top of those and make sure that our students have access to the, the best equipment and the best training. Very good. Well, uh, gentlemen, we have about a minute and 30 seconds left, so Anything you would like to say uh, generally uh, to wrap up this session? It goes really quickly. We it could talk about quickly. this for an hour and a half. So, well, you you mentioned you know the mm -hmm. industrial arts where, you know maybe you go once a week or an hour after school. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to say build bird houses, but <laughs> you know it's kind of like the difference between playing rec league basketball and being on a varsity team. You have for the chapter seventy certificate is. You can see there's a lot that goes into mm -hmm. establishing the program, maintaining the program, but there's also a lot expected from the student over the course of their high school career. So, and, and just to be even more specific, you know, our students are receiving at least a thousand hours of training in each program, which you wouldn't really see in, a, in an industrial arts class. And all of our teachers have spent significant time out in the workforce mm -hmm. and then gotten their training as teachers as well. So, so they're really dual threats. Um, and, and Amazing. I, I do want to say our, our, our staff is, is fantastic. They're so committed to our kids and their success that, that they really make our school what it is and, and, uh, and they care about every student and the success of every student and 
and that's why we're in a good position as we are and why we have so much to offer you know, the, the people of Chelmsford mm -hmm. and all of our other towns. You should come to the next open house. I will. And thank you, gentlemen. We are out of time, and I want to thank our two guests.